and welcome to this week's edition of the National Hour. I'm Jeff Hammersley. He's Hayden Grove. Unlike Undertaker's WrestleMania streak, we are still moving on another week of the National Hour, but a streak that we've not seen a lower seed team in the tournament winning the national title. And for UConn, a seven seed, Shabazz Napier. It's a Shabazz world after all. UConn beats Kentucky 60-54. to Hayden, spectacular game last night or what? I thought it was a pretty hard game to watch, actually. I mean, I was kind of sitting there watching it while doing some other things, but, man, I mean, it, it was kind of – there just didn't seem to be all that much uh, exciting basketball, aside from that dunk from James Young. That was fantastic. Yes. If you haven't seen that, you'll, you'll see it now. We're going to put it up there. But, um, wow, unbelievable dunk. Um, but the game wasn't that good, I didn't think. Um, you know, Kentucky played – iffy and you know you can't just rode their experience and i just can't believe i just literally cannot believe that uh or figuratively cannot believe that uh that uconn did it i mean uconn had eight seven seed really no chance i didn't have them beating villanova and then they come win a national championship i can't believe how similar it was to the kemba yeah I mean, right how yeah. similar was it to kemba i mean should they rode shabazz just like the team a couple years ago, ago rode kemba their one guy National champions. It's crazy. I guess that's just like a, a UConn thing at this point. Well, I think for UConn, I believe Napier was a freshman on that team behind yeah, Kemba. he was. So he had a few points in that game, but really this was his team. And for most of this game, it was sloppy turnovers. Just really everything was out of sync at times. You come on a run in the beginning of the game, and then Kentucky, well, they went on their own run, got back within a point. But really, they never had control of this game. The best they could do was be within one point of UConn. But yeah, as you said, they're hating. I mean, Shabazz Napier, 8 of 16, 22 points. The workhorse behind this team, and really for this entire tournament run, deservingly so was the player of the game and player of the tournament. But still, I really think it's a 7-8 matchup like that. It wasn't the two best teams that played in AT&T Stadium last night. No, I don't think it was either. I think you had, one, I think you had the most talented team there. Absolutely. I think that Kentucky yeah. was the most talented team by far. But I, I think that UConn just had that experience. I think, the, you know, having Shabazz there, who was supposed to be a stud, you know, for his four years, kind of laid low for a while until he burst onto the scene right now. Um, but I think overall the experience was just too much, and I think Kentucky, you know, at the end of the day just didn't have it. And that's, that was the difference in this game. I really don't believe the best team is there. I think the best team in this tournament was still Michigan State. Absolutely. I, I think that they were still the best team. I think that Michigan was a close second, and I think Wisconsin was even one of the better teams. Yeah. Florida, too. I mean, but that's what the tournament's about. The best team isn't always going to win. If that was the case, it would be, you know, AP Top 25, or it would be... Um, Probably Florida, Wisconsin, right. kind of... Florida, right, it Arizona would be BCS kind of type stuff. Right, right exactly. But, but I think yeah. For Kentucky, I mean, team. Harrison saved them against Michigan, game-winning three. Saved them against Wisconsin, game-winning three from essentially the same part of the court. I mean, then that... At the end of the title game last night, tries to take the same kind of three, misses it. You're not going to get that shot to fall three straight games. It's just not going to happen. But what, oddly enough for Kentucky, and I think the irony for Calipari was, he lost the national title with Memphis against Kansas by missing free throws. Same kind of theme last night against UConn. First half, Kentucky's 5-9. and nine. Second half, 8-15. of 15. 54% from the free throw line. UConn, 4-4 four four in the first half. 6-6 six of six in the second half. 10 for 10 in, in total, 100% there. If Kentucky hits five or six more. They hit six more of their free throws. It's a tie game. They're going overtime, but they just could not do that. Yeah, they, I mean, that's what it came down to. And this happened here at home in Ohio State for quite a while. I mean, Ohio State, Most of the season, free right, throw Ohio State had Ohio State had problems shooting the free throws all year long, couldn't win games. Same thing happened here. UConn was hitting their shots, hitting their free throws. Kentucky wasn't, and that's one of the big the big factors that decided this game. Again, there were other a lot of other factors, but this was a big one. And you know, say they make a good uh, ten more or ten more of their shots, I mean, they win pretty Absolutely. much. Yeah. I mean, for UConn, at one point, a fifteen point lead in this game. If one of their star players, DeAndre Daniels, he was four of fourteen from the field in the game, zero of four from the land of three. If he's two or three more threes in, hits two or three of his threes. It's a runaway game. UConn, up by 15 first half, could have easily blown out Kentucky by 30 points in a national championship game. But to let Kentucky get back in the game, get into rhythm, really sloppy turnovers, almost doomed UConn down the stretch. I mean, Napier, a couple of bad passes. It's just a couple reckless minutes entirely in that second half of the game. But I think UConn, did they deserve to win the game? Yes. They, I think they, by far, Shabazz Napier, 22 points, carried that team on his back. 
but as we mentioned before, it's I watch it once, but this is very reminiscent of the the Butler Yukon game when it was just it was hard to just watch the entire game from start to finish. It was just so sloppy, but at the same time, this is the final four, this is the championship game. Well, that's what Yukon does. They play a, they don't play a sloppy game, but they play a, a different game that's maybe not as uh, aesthetically pleasing. You know, it's more you know, grind it out, get a win. I mean, Shabazz is a wonder to watch, so I shouldn't say the entire team is, um, you know, I shouldn't say that every single player makes it ugly, right. but because he is beautiful to watch on I'm, a basketball yeah. court. But, I mean, overall, you again, the parallels are just so, so crazy to me. To have a game against, like, a very similar game to the game that they played against Butler, to have a guy like Kemba Walker and Shabazz, to have both of them on the same team back then, and then you have... Uh, the similarities are just so eerie to me. I just, I, it, it's, it's a little bit weird. I'm a little bit weirded yeah. out how similar they are. And, um, but again, maybe that's just the way that UConn goes about their business. Maybe they just, you know, and every time they win, it's the same. And I, I remember we, they, they had a shot of winning another national championship. I don't know if it was with Drummond or the beat, but they didn't win because it wasn't that, that, time, that right. type of team. But now, same kind of team, win a national championship. I think this does wonders for Kevin Ollie. I think it does. Kentucky did not lead once in the national title game. The best they could get was a tie, which happened twice, and really, the deficit-wise, they got within the point late in the second half, couldn't take the lead. But at the end of the game, Shabazz Napier and the whole post-ceremony stuff, Hungry Huskies said, quote, Hungry Huskies, this is what happens when you ban us. UConn last year wasn't in the tournament. The graduation rates in the classes, too low. NCAA basically said, you're gonna sit out a year, get your grades up, then you'll come back to the tournament picture. Fair or foul on the shots being fired by Shabazz Napier post-winning the championship? I'm going to say foul. Academics is what college athletics, at the end of the day, is supposed to be all about. And, you know, when you, when you, when you make comments like that after winning a national championship, after working so hard, I mean, maybe it wasn't the heat of the moment, but I'm going to say foul. I didn't, I didn't really love that. What about you? I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to say fair. I think okay. it's, it's the whole climate of what's happening with the NCAA right now. There's the whole unionization thing in Northwestern. That's happening. But at the same time, the, the Final Four brings in billions. It's, it's a money maker. It's, let, let's not kid ourselves. There is money coming in from all angles for this thing. How much of that actually goes back to the kids? And that's the bigger question there. For a guy like Shabazz Napier, <coughs> excuse me, but I think for a guy like Napier or anybody who's on that team, what are they seeing off of this? They're in college for the one or two years. I mean, for Napier, he's a senior. He's in there for four years now. But look at Kentucky. The whole one-and-done policy there, I mean, it's those guys, they're just using college just to get there to go to the NBA draft. If they had their own choice, they would probably leave straight out of high school, but I can understand, I mean, Napier said at times he's been hungry at night because he doesn't have any money, or whatever, the stipend's gone, all that stuff. But still at the same time, you at least got to give the kids something other than just the full ride for the university. But at times, it's not a complete full ride. There is still some money they have to pay into it, but I think you have to give them a little bit more than what you're giving right now. I mean, that's, that's, that's for a whole separate debate. And I don't know if I want to go into the whole paying players. I personally think that they get a lot as it is. Um, but again, I, I think that you, if you could if you can find a middle ground where you're not giving them too much, but you're not yes. giving them too little, you've got to find a middle ground. And I think that's, you know, college athletes do, do get a lot, but they also do put in a ton of work. So I can see the, the side on both issues. Um, that was an interesting comment, though, that uh, Shabazz said about go, being starving, going, uh, going yeah. to bed at night. I mean, that's something that shouldn't happen. And I, 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 maybe the word starving was a little, uh, a little much. I mean, kids in Africa are yes. starving. I don't know if Shabazz Napier is at starving. but um, Making that on the eve of the Final Four, then after the game, essentially reiterating that fact, that's on the pedestal, you just won a championship. You know you're going to get the microphone after that performance, and he says this. I think I mean, maybe it's good because he's on his way right. out. I don't know, but we don't. That's a whole different debate down the line. As time goes on, this is as long as this drags out, the more of a conversation this will become. Yep. But switching from the UConn title win to Kentucky losing, rumor mill says John Calipari, coach of the Kentucky Wildcats, could be going to the LA Lakers. I mean, it's even though it's a rumor, a lot of people have said no, it's not true. He's staying at Kentucky. Calipari has even said this is his dream job being at Kentucky. He loves the place. How much stock do you buy into this right now? I buy zero into the Lakers. I mean, I know there's a new owner. I know that they're going to get rid of D'Antoni. I know, but I just can't see it, man. I can't see Calipari leaving college. Um, I mean, yes, on the surface, it kind of makes sense. You know, he's done a lot in the college level. Maybe it's time for him to move up. But I, don't, I just, I don't see it. I, I just don't see, you know, it's, we all know. 
that the college game is a very, very, very different game from the Absolutely. NBA. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I could argue that Kyle Parry is the most NBA type of coach in, in college basketball. I agree with that. He's had, he spent some time in the NBA. I believe he was also an assistant for, in the 76ers. He was a coach for the brief time for, the, for the, the then New Jersey Nets. But I think this is, I think, sort of similar to what happened in like 2003 with Roy Williams. He was at Kansas. The reporter comes up after him. Are you going to take the North Carolina job? I would never leave for North Carolina. What happens? He goes to North Carolina. Saban. Yeah. You remember the Saban? Saban, Miami Dolphins. I won't leave Miami. He leaves for Alabama for greener pastures. I'm going to buy some stock. I think it may not be the Lakers. It could be somebody else. Maybe the Knicks. I don't know. But I, That would be a nightmare. Yeah, that... That would be an absolute nightmare. If Calipari went to the Knicks with uh, Phil Jackson, that, you think Phil Jackson will bring him in there? No way, man. No way. I, I, I would never buy that. I don't know, man. But I think for Calipari, I mean, he's, wherever he's gone, he's won. Right. Not in the NBA, though. NBA, he struggled for a brief time. It was like some number below 30 from 500 with the New Jersey Nets. But he was at UMass. Right. Final four run. Memphis, final four run. He's developed guys like Marcus Camby, Derrick Rose, and essentially most of the past stars in the past two or three years out of Kentucky. Right. The past four or five years, actually. Every year it's a loaded roster. You give him some guys who are developing, still developing, or are actually developed in the NBA, I don't know, you may get something that's, I don't know, you may get a winner there, but he's right now at the moment he's still at Kentucky. Right, and that's, that's you know, he's done a lot for them. We'll see if he, maybe he has to win a national championship or a couple national yeah. championships at Kentucky before he, uh, before he moves along. All right, that's basically the wrap-up of what happened last night for the national championship game. Now we're going to do the, the national hour way, way, way too early. Top way five too early. for next year. I'm going to go first here. My, guy, my team's number one, Duke. I think that team yeah. is going to be fully loaded. Wisconsin only losing Brust. I got Kansas. I think for really the Jayhawks. If they can bring the same, pu the, the same puzzle pieces back, they could be a team to watch out for. Arizona, I'm going to go with. I think for the Arizona uh, Wildcats, that could be a team that really, uh, I just don't know about, they're going to be top five, but I think they will be there. And I think for the, for the Kentucky Wildcats, a team like that, being in for the national championship picture, was not even the top 25 to begin with, but they're going to work their way back up. They've already shown that they can get back. If they get hot, they can win. That's right. Uh, my top five looks a little different. Uh, pretty actually not too much different. I have, uh, I have Duke, obviously. I think their recruiting class is uh, stellar. Maybe if Javari stays, that's going to be the national champion. I have Kansas in there. I have Arizona. I have UNC in there, number four. They have a, they have a great recruiting class as well. My number five team, Who? SMU. 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 Got a point guard coming in from Dallas. Going to be a big, gonna be a big, uh, big addition there. I think they're ready to take the next step. That that's a real surprise there. That's my surprise, my but mind, that's not even my surprise. Pick. My mind is just blown right now. SMU top. They're mad. They're that. mad about I getting. See they're mad about getting eliminated from the tournament, or for not even getting into the tournament. They're mad about that. They're going to ride that into next year. You watch. You think so? I think so. Okay. One quick thing. Surprise team for next year. I got Texas. I think Texas. They're bringing back essentially the whole entire roster. Basically, I think that team. If they get hot, which the thing is, if the team gets hot, they will be good. I think for Texas, if they get hot, could run the table in the Big 12. That may be the team to watch out for next year. Kansas, that could be the one thing that's stopping them from taking another Big 12 crown. My surprise team is right here at home, the Ohio State Buckeyes. you got three talented, talented players coming in in uh, Katie Bates-Diop. you got D'Angelo Russell, and you got Jay Sean Tate. you got Cam Williams coming off the bench, who didn't play at all this year. You got Mark Loving. You got Sam Thompson. You got a lot of talent there. I think that that's going to be the team to watch out for. Maybe they don't win a national championship, but I think they're going to be a lot better than people expect. Whoa. My mind is blowing again. I'm blowing your mind today, Jeff. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have right now for college basketball. We'll take a short break and come back with some more sports here on the National Hour. And welcome back to the National Hour. We're about to get into some baseball talk here on a beautiful day in Columbus today. Oh, absolutely. It's, as you can hear in my voice, the allergies are out. It's, I'm a little bit wheezy, but if you, sorry for the cough in the first segment, but that was just, that was just the allergy stuff getting to me right now. But still, I'd rather take the warm weather, wearing shorts, 
than wearing a jacket, long pants, two hoodies, and a toboggan. I'll take the allergies in spring any day of the weekend with that. Baseball is back. Baseball is back. The Clippers are playing tonight in Columbus. I think they're still looking for their first win, but hey, they get to play baseball. It's nice and warm outside. I know the Indians even had batting practice outside for just the second time this season. They played six games, so you can tell the weather has not been good thus far, but let's dive right into it. Cincinnati Reds not starting off well. Uh, last in the NL Central Division, they are 2-5 and five to start the year. How are they going to turn this around? I mean, I mean, look at this, Hayden. This schedule, they began loss with the Cardinals, but they got to play the Cardinals, then they got to play Tampa Bay. Then you got Pittsburgh, Chicago, Pittsburgh. That series alternating, and a three with Pittsburgh, three with the uh, Cubbies, and then the road games with Pittsburgh. But I'm looking at their schedule here, and it's just from like the 18th of April to the 27th of uh, to the end of the month, basically, they're all on the road. It's, it's like three straight series where they're not going to be back in Great American Ballpark. That can either go really good or really bad, but right now you're two for five, two and five. It looks like that could be a very treacherous nine games there, even longer for the Reds. The Reds are in a dire straits right now. Araldus is out, Matt Latos is out, Billy Hamilton, who is supposed to be their stud AAA uh, guy coming up, speed guy, not getting the job done as of yet. If he doesn't get it turned around, this first month could be the end of the season for the Reds. I mean, realistically, that's what it seems like. Yeah, we've mentioned this before, the NL Central will be the toughest division probably in baseball right yep. now. And the more room you give the Cardinals and the Pirates and little, maybe even the Brewers and Cubs, who knows what's going to happen. The more room you give them, the harder it's going to be to catch back up with them. We've seen last season where it was essentially the Cardinals, Pirates, and Reds fighting from essentially June to September for playoff spots. But if you had a four or five game losing stretch, you were almost dead to rights from not getting a playoff spot. So if you're starting off bad, you're going to need to pull your act together quickly to get back into that picture. It may not seem that much now, but in September, you're going to be thinking yourself a lot when you only know you're only two games off than being eight games off the pace for a playoff spot. Right, and that's going to be the problem with them. I, I just think that I don't know if they're going to overcome this start. I mean, I, you know, if, again, we are early, and if they do turn it around in the month of April, but if they can't get it together soon, I mean, it's going to cause trouble. When you, go, when you have a really bad month of April against a lot of divisional opponents, that does not spell good things yeah. in the future. And I, I, I'm not exactly sure what's going on with Matt Latos. I think he had a setback today, so that's not good. They need as much pitching as they can get, especially with, you know, uh, a lot of young guys out there. But um, Price, new manager Price, not starting off well in Cincy. No, not at all. I'm looking also with him being manager, looking at just the batting averages, it's, I mean, when you have a total of around 224, that's not going to help you. But a lot of your stars here, looking at guys like Votto and Bruce, uh, Votto 240, Bruce 160, Billy Hamilton 0.059. I mean, you can't be doing that in the majors. Mid to low one, but if you're hitting below that, that's treacherous right there. That, you're, that's, you're almost, well, that's hazardous for a spot. That's almost one spot where you know you're not going to get the hit there. And really, if you're the Reds, you're struggling. You need as many hits, as many scoring opportunities as you possibly can right now. Right, but at the same time, as we said, it is very, very early. We're about six, seven games in. I mean, you can't judge like 0 59. I mean, there are guys that go six, seven games without a hit in the season. Right, that's true. And, but I mean, it's, and that's not good ever, but I mean, you can't judge a guy but, based on that. But collectively looking, this team, this is, a, this is not just Hamilton. I'm not trying to single them out, but it's a theme with most other guys. The averages are low here, and that's why you're losing games. I mean, look, you're two and five. If you're having the, a collective problem this early, it's going to keep on happening, especially when you're on the road especially with Pirates and Cubs and Pittsburgh. Let's say Pittsburgh sweeps in one of those series. That's a four-game gap right there in the division. may not seem like much in April, but as you keep letting this happen, it's only going to get worse and worse and worse. Right, and they do, they need, they do need to pick it up in <coughs> April if they have any chance of winning anything. But, um, you know, that's, that, that's how it goes in baseball. I mean, they've had injuries. They've had, you know, just about everything. They can't, they can't hit the ball right now. Things are going to have to change for Cincinnati, or they're going to be looking themselves – at, at season over yeah. in May. I, I mean, mean, it's just not good. The thing you may want to even ask yourself, excuse me, really, was firing Dusty Baker the right or wrong move? I think, again, it's too early. I, think it's I too don't early know. For that. But still, I, I, I don't get it. You, put, you make a playoff run. I know you get a wild card, you lose, and stuff, stuff happens like that. But really, <clears throat> excuse me again, if you make the playoffs, you're, you're almost there. You, you're a lot further than where the Mariners were right. two or three years ago, and, but you're going to let the guy go. I know you underperform, but still, as long as you're getting there, Eventually, something's going to happen, but still I can see the, the, the rationale being, look, you got to do something eventually. You, so what? You go to the playoffs, but you got to win. But still, as long as you get there, you at least give the fan base hope 
that maybe, hey, this could be our year, rather than being a team. Look at the Mariners and Astros, where it's May or June, and it's always like, well, maybe next year. But right. as long as you make the postseason, there's a slim chance that you may actually walk out with the World Series ring. Right. And speaking of another team up two hours up the road in Cleveland, uh, who did make the playoffs last year as well, they started off okay. They started off 3-1, and one, big, big time four-game start, and then they lose two out of three to Minnesota. Uh, they did win on the home opener. Nick Swisher from right here in Columbus uh, smacked the three-run home. Two, three it was something. Was it, it, was two, it, was a, it was a bomb. It put them ahead, and they took the home opener, but lost the next two. Um, and then they got rained out last night for the second time this season. They got rained out out in Oakland. Um, so they're going to be playing a doubleheader tomorrow night. But for the Indians, I think, again, I think they're keeping their head afloat. You know, you lose a series like that, you're 3-3 three and three on the year. You're still in second place, and that's where a lot of people expected them to be at this point. Um, the big problem with them is... They're, they're, getting, they're getting in a lot of runners and scoring position opportunities, but they're not hitting the ball when, when it gets to that yeah. point. I mean, that's a big problem. They're looking at some of the games they've lost. They've lost to Minnesota 10-7. They lost to Minnesota 7-3. If you get a couple of runs, especially in that 10-7 loss, if you get one or two of those runs, and it's a ball game again. I mean, that, you can come back with two outs to try to get something to go there in a rally, but still, you've got to find a way to put some runs down there. Now, looking at their schedule, San Diego, series with them, when I mean, the first game was postponed, they put the Chicago White Sox, and it's at Detroit. So that Detroit series is going to be huge. The White Sox, too, because it's a division matchup. But still, I think for the Indians, it's a better position than what the Reds are in, because the Reds, that NL Central is just a monstrosity to be dealing with. At least for the Indians' case, it's going to be Detroit and Cleveland neck to neck. And I think with that, winning Detroit's big, but you have Terry Francona. I think he's won in Boston. He's, he's won where he's before he was in Cleveland. So I think the mentality there is, I think the approach is a lot different than what the Reds have. Reds' new guy, not really that much proven. Indians, this guy's won a couple World Series rings. He knows what he's doing. So I think as long as they listen to Francona, they should be in good hands. Even though they're, what, 500 right now? They're still, it's, as, I can't Again, use this all, argument. All, all of this is, See, all this is, thing too, is, I think it's too early. I'm but, listening to myself. I'm using the, the counter argument, it's too early. But then with the Reds, it's like, well, they're struggling. Well, that's, the, See, that, that's, that's the that's thing. That's my it, problem. It, it, right. It is, for the Indians, it's too early. But for the Reds, yeah. they, they, they look like they could fall right out of the race here in Absolutely. April. So we'll keep an eye on that. But we're going to flip it over to hockey for Mr. Hammersley. And uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets are in the middle of a playoff race. Yeah, right now for the Blue Jackets. Rough week that just happened, but they got a couple big wins. The big one being the Flyers, 2-0 in that matchup. Shutout against Bobrovsky's former team. Huge win there. It's a two critical points going back to the playoff chase. But also a one point, a one, excuse me, one goal loss to the Chicago Blackhawks. Losing with seconds remaining in the game. Could have had one critical point. Just couldn't get it. Even though McKenzie scored, Johansson scored, and Artem Anisimov scored. They just were just so, so close. It's really, if you were there and watched the game, it was just a brutal loss to have against the Blackhawks, who didn't have Taves in, as playing, but still came back, beat the Islanders 4-0 this past Sunday. 90% playoff chance right now. And I think for collectively for the Blue Jacket faithful, you got to start believing one or two more wins. Win two of your next four, you're back in the playoffs. Hayden, you getting pumped up for this playoff chaser? Because I am I live the past two weeks. Have just been losing my mind with this. I'm too focused on baseball, but I do. I have been following it, and that big that that win against Philly was huge. Philly's a three seed and the Met, or the third team in the Metropolitan Division. They have 89 points right now. Um, Columbus is 87, and they're in the last wild card spot as we speak. But I mean, at this point, New Jersey is the next team, and they have 84 points. The season ends on Saturday, I believe. Yeah, it is got against yeah. against the Florida Panthers. Yep, your of Panthers, course, of course. So um, I think, as you said, 90 percent playoff chances. Hey. I talk to, uh, I've talked to a lot of people who think that this is, this is the time. This is the, the Blue Jackets Absolutely. are going to get right back in it. I think for the Blue Jackets, unlike pastures where you're fighting to get in, you're actually in the playoff chase. And even even better, if, let's say the Flyers lose the game. And the Blue Jackets, somehow they win three of their next four. They could steal Philly's three spot in the Metropolitan Division, maybe play the Rangers again. I mean, we know the whole Rick Nash thing a couple weeks ago. He oh. comes in. You get a potential seven-game series with that, with at least two games guaranteed in New York, two guaranteed at Nationwide Arena. That is, it's going to be, I, the Nationwide Arena is just going to be off. It's just going to be so absurd for those playoff games. Even, even though they may play Boston or whoever, I think the environment is just going to be so amped up. Blue Jackets may have a chance if they walk in with some momentum into the playoffs. I think, I think you're right. I think this city, you know, although I did tell you about this, the Blue Jackets were rated the number one least uh, 
popular team in America, but oh, yes. the people of Columbus would definitely be excited if they made the playoffs because I think that would be a start for them, a start in the right direction. You know, it's kind of been a decade of misery for the for the Blue Jackets. One playoff appearance, just not a all that much going to, on. against a Detroit, sweep, yeah, which sweep I didn't plus. do many favors. Exactly. So I think if they if they get in the playoffs and they perform well, maybe it's a step forward in, in getting that popularity. And it looks like right now, it looks like they're going to make the playoffs unless there's some catastrophic thing that happens and they lose to Florida, who is six, it was the ninth seed yes. in the East, uh, 64 points. If they lose that game, they probably don't deserve to be in the playoffs. So well, yeah. I don't, you know. I mean, if you lose, like, even though they played that, a critical three games down the stretch at the end of, on the road, which is going to be top, the practice time won't be existent, but... The star power is there, and they, I, I agree. If they lose to the Florida Panthers, even though it's your Florida team, they, My New Jersey, team. no, that is, no. I, I don't even know what I, what I would do if that actually happens if Florida wins and the Blue Jackets miss the playoffs by like a point. But still, I think with guys like Derek McKenzie, Brian Johansson, who they've scored big time games. I mean, McKenzie scored against the, I almost had the starting gate against the Chicago Blackhawks. I mean, that, you almost thought that's going to happen. They could win this game by maybe two or three goals. Didn't work that way, though. But I think the star power with, like, as I mentioned before, Anisimov, even Ryan Murray with company, Mark Letestu, those kind of guys who have really been the cornerstones for the entire season, Boone Jenner, too, in the power play, that might be enough. They may potentially easily take a three spot from Philly, might actually advance around in the Stanley Cup playoffs, but still playoffs are a week away, or two weeks away, season, a couple games left to go. But really, Hayden, looking, just looking at it, the pieces are so there for a potential playoff run for the Blue Jackets. The pieces are there, and it's not Cleveland. If it, was Cleveland, yeah. if it was Cleveland, I'd be, I would be very nervous if I were you. But this is Columbus. It's a different town. I definitely think that things are going to go in their way for these last couple games, unless the Florida Panthers give them fits, and I don't think they should. Yeah, I, I think so, too. I think, as we've said this twice already, if Florida, even Dallas, if they come back and beat the Blue Jackets, that's the doomsday scenario. Right, I forget. I keep forget, still, I, I continually forget about that Dallas game. That Dallas game. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. prayers to Rich Preverly, but um, the Blue Jackets are up in that game, and that will be a resume game. Yep. So they already have a lead. That's even more. If, of their I mean, if you start off, the, the thing is going to be the, near, the neat fact. <clears throat> excuse me again. Nathan Horton maybe maybe out of that game, but he scored the goal. He's going to get credited with that goal, though. Right. So it could be the first time a guy who doesn't play the game will actually get credit for a goal in game. I mean, my mind, it's been blown with the SMU thing earlier in the last segment in Ohio State as a surprise team. And with that Nathan Horton thing, I may just walk off the stage right now. I, mean, you, you, I, I don't know. You it, might have to. It, it's too crazy, man. Way too crazy for me for one National Hour episode. All right, well, let's calm it down. And when we get back, we're going to talk some NFL draft here on the National Hour. And welcome back to the National Hour. We just talked about the tournament games, the championship game. We talked about some MLB, NHL. Now we're going to talk about the NFL. It's draft time. We also have a lot of notes to go with it, but still, draft coming up in the next month. Houston Texans have the one pick. Rams are going to be two. They took the two pick from Washington because of the whole RG3 thing. But really, Hayden, this draft, a lot of good guys that could go early. I don't know who's going to go number one right now. There's just so many names that pop up. I wouldn't be surprised if anybody got called. I think th I think it's appropriate that the movie Draft Day, starring Kevin Costner in, as the Cleveland Browns GM, is coming out this year. Because this draft could go in basically any direction you want it to. I mean, there is talk of four quarterbacks going top four. There is talk of, you know, or not four, but two quarterbacks going top four. There's talk of no quarterbacks going top four. There's talk of defensive guys going top four. I mean, I it's... But that, those first four picks may be the most interesting four picks I've seen in a long, long time. You got, first of all, you got the Houston Texans who are in dire need of a franchise quarterback, but at the same time have gone the route of the defensive end of the past with Mario Williams. You got the St. Louis Rams who could very easily trade out of that position if they would really like to. Then you got the Jacksonville Jaguars, who, let's just face it, need about everything yeah. they, can, they can get. Although they did sign Chad Henney back to a deal. From maybe the University from of Michigan. From the University of Michigan, I don't know. And then you got the Browns, who have some pieces here and there, just need a quarterback. But is the quarterback the right way to go? We don't know yet. It's, it's interesting. I mean, okay. And then Austin ran out the top five Oakland yep. Raiders there, who also, I mean, the top five, basically, it's who do, what, what do you need the most? I mean, there's so many options there, but if you had to start off your number one overall pick, uh, let's do a simulation for the top four picks, basically. Who would you go with in those first top four? 
Jeff, this is a very hard question. You can't just ask me that straight up. I need to have multiple hours of sleep. I need to have Dan Hope sitting next to me, chatting me in the just ear. Crunching numbers down, basically. Dan, Dan Go Hope, with him. Dan, Dan Hope doesn't sleep. Dan Hope doesn't sleep. All he does is crunch numbers and put out the most brilliant draft stuff ever. I need to have him sitting right here, which he may or may not be next week. We'll get into that. Um, but, I, I, for, all right. We, Franz and I, sports director Franz and I, were talking about this earlier. The first pick of the NFL draft will, will set the dominoes. If it's Clowney, I think you're going to see a lot of quarterbacks going from there. If it's Sammy Watkins, you're going to see a lot of, you know, you're going to yeah. see a lot of, you, you, we don't know. If you see a quarterback, okay, then you kinda, you'll see Jadavion and you'll see Sammy in the next right. four picks. But I'm going to say that the Houston Texans go with Jadavion Clowney. Really? Because they've done it in the past. They've gotten Mario Williams, and he was a very successful player there until he went to Franz's hometown of Buffalo, signed a big deal. Um, so I, I don't know. What, what, did Franz entice him to go to Buffalo? I don't know. But it worked out. It worked out for the Texans. I think they're going to do it again. They're going to take the most talented, most freakish player in this draft in Mr. Jadavion Clowney. It's funny that you mentioned Buffalo. Because that's who I think Mar that's where I go first. It's going to be from Buffalo, Cleo Mack. No. I think Cleo Mack. What he did wow. against Ohio State in that first game, he picked off Braxton Miller and took it to the house for a touchdown. He's, he kept Buffalo defensively in that game for a lot longer than if he, that he wasn't there. I think he may be the dark horse. Even though he's at one of the top ratings for like Scouts, Scouts Inc.'s top 32, ranks at number three up with a 96 total grade, Jadavion Clowney at 98. I think long-term Khalil Mack, the guy's, a, he, the guy's a monster, basically. I think it, for the Texans, put him on that team, start building some of the pieces in the later rounds, you may have something better than what you have with Jadavian Clowney. I think Clowney, the whole senior year thing, wow, how much was he trying the effort thing? Let's say he doesn't like what's happening in Houston. Will he shut down just like he did in South Carolina? Will he work harder? That's not a gamble I want to take. I think Khalil Mack, he's shown, he's shown and proved he's a top pick. Take him. Khalil Mack is not a gamble, but Jadavian Clowney is. That makes no sense I think to it me. Is. Khalil Mack, well, also, first, also I, I am not, right Khalil Mack is definitely, I believe, a top 10, top 5 pick. But to be the number one pick overall with Jadavion, with Sammy Watkins, with Johnny Football, with Teddy Bridgewater, with Bortles, I just cannot see it. I mean, I, li I love the guy. Even at two, I wouldn't mind it. But, to have, but for the number one pick for Khalil Mack, for a position that is not that impactful, I mean, it's impactful, but it's not the most impactful, I just can't. I mean... I just don't, okay, if the Texans take Khalil Mack, that's not a bad pick. I'm just telling you right now. But it's not a, it's, it's a way bigger gamble than if they took Jadavion Clowney. How much of a bigger gamble is that than San Diego going with Ryan Leaf over Peyton Manning? You get to look at it. All these guys, they look good on paper. We don't know what they're going to do in the next five or ten years. I mean, I, the Green Bay Packers guy in the 90s, I forget, like Mandarich or something, was one of the Tony top, Mandarich. Tony Mandarich. Instant hit, you can't miss with him. Miss everybody else around him went pros. They went in the Hall of Fame. We don't know what's going to happen with this draft. Who, who knows? The top ten guys could be Hall of Famers. Three of the top five could be busts. We just don't know. But I think for, for like, the most secured pick, in my opinion, because I've seen Cleo Mack play. That's the bias there. I haven't seen Clowney play, but I've seen Mack play against against Ohio State. I think he's the one guy where even if something goes wrong around him, he is still going to be a constant piece that will still work 100% every single day. All right, well, the, the thing is that neither of us think that, that uh, the Texans are going to pick a quarterback. Yes, that's the big that, thing. That's the big thing. I think that's the thing that we got to remember. A lot of teams are saying, hey, or a lot of people are saying, hey, there's a guy right down the street named Johnny Football who would ignite this fan base, who would be the face of the franchise, who would be an easy number one pick. I still think they could go there too, but I think they're going to ultimately end up with Johnny. Second pick overall, is St. Louis going to stay? That's a good question. I think, honestly, I, I want to say they will. But I, then again, who knows? Probably know Washington says we want our pick back. What do you want for it? But I, I don't know, but I think the Rams, they could get some pieces there. Sam Bradford, I know he's been hurt. You don't know what's going to happen with that whole thing. I mean, that goes for a lot of guys. Guys who, who have a history of injury, do you maybe want to have a backup plan, contingency plan for if something else happens again? But I think for the Rams, I mean, you could go defensively, you could go offensively. I mean, that could be a place where you may land a quarterback and just get them ready for if something happens. But still, I wouldn't want to go that way, though. But still, maybe someone on the defensive end, maybe Clowney, if he's still available there. Maybe Mac Clowney, that one, two, we don't know, that, that could happen. Whoever 
Houston takes the Rams take the other, but still, it's the draft. Crazy things have happened. I think defensive guys will go at least one two in that draft. Yeah, I think I think they're going to move out. I think St. Louis is going to move out. I think they don't have any business up there. But if they do stay, I could easily see them going with Mac. I could also easily see them going with uh, with an offensive lineman like Jake Matthews. I mean, they, both guys are solid options for them. They've had a lot of offensive line trouble. They need to get that solidified. Um, the Rams are really interesting, though. I don't think they've given up on Sam Bradford, so I don't think they're going to take a quarterback. I don't. I don't. I don't like your. I don't. I don't like that one out of you, Jeff. You never know, like, man. I know. I know. But there are some people who have said it, and you, so you're not. You're not uh, by yourself out there. So, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, Plot twist. Same, top seven picks are all quarterbacks. <laughs> I'll just walk. Well, no, no, that, that I, craziness. I think the plot twist is when none of the f- f- top five picks is a quarterback. Then it gets interesting. Okay, so I'm going to go with Matthews at two. Who do you have? I'm going to say Clowney at two. Clowney Max two. goes first, Clowney goes second. All right. So the third pick in the draft belongs to the Jacksonville Jaguars, who, as I said before, need just about everything. Where do they go? Well, since they just re-got Henny, that's, you can't go back with another quarterback. So you had to go somewhere else. Can you, though? Know? Maybe you could if you really wanted to. But I think... You already have the whole Justin Blackman experience has already happened. Maybe you get Sammy Watkins, somebody. If you've already invested somebody into a quarterback, try to have a receiving core. You just chuck it and just see what happens there. But, or you could go with a guy like Taylor and Juan for offensive tackle or something. But I think, I don't know what you're going to do. If you need some random pieces here, I don't know what you're going Robin, to take. I think you're Robinson if you need an offensive lineman if Matthews is gone. I mean, I just, I, it's just, there's so many people. And this is one of the rare drafts where the, the teams, there's so many needs they have there. It all dictates on what happens before that person goes. Yep. So one person goes off the board, and that changes the whole dynamic for the rest of the thing. Sure. But I think for Jacksonville, I'm going to go on a stretch. Sammy Watkins, he's a number four guy in scouts report. Maybe take speed and maybe see what that can do for you. All right, so I went with Clowney first overall, Matthew second. I'm going to say that the Jacksonville Jaguars go get a quarterback. Really? It's either going to be Bortles or it's going to be Teddy Bridgewater. It's not going to be Johnny Football. Amir Khan, for some reason. Not even Kenny Guyton? No, not Kenny Guy. They have, they don't like, I don't, for some reason, they don't need a face of the, fr- they don't like the whole face of the franchise. They had an opportunity, they had the opportunity of a lifetime to bring in their hometown guy, Tim Tebow, was right there for the taking, and they, they said, didn't we're want not him. interested. They said, we're not interested in Tim Tebow. We don't care what he brings, and I was shocked. So I'm going to say they're not going to go Manziel. They're going to go with Bridger, Bridgewater or Bortles, and I think at the end of the day, it might be Bridgewater. Uh, it's my pick. I could see Bortles, he's that Central Florida figure staying in Jackson That's in the true. Florida area. That could, that, could, that could be a big factor there. But that could be. The Jacksonville's one of those pieces. It's whoever the – what happens in the war room at the last second, it's just got to come down to, guys, who do we – what do we absolutely need to just yep. get that person before something else, before we lose our time on the clock? Fourth pick overall, Cleveland Browns. The subject of the draft day movie and maybe the most wild card outside of Jacksonville. Who do you have them take it? I think they, this is where the quarterback happens. I think it's going to be, I think Blake Bortles is going to land there. I think for Bortles, he's worked out with Ben Roethlisberger right now. I think that Roethlisberger has the pedigree. He's had a couple Super Bowls. He's a tiring figure. It takes a, an army to bring him down. So I think Bortles can learn from that how to really move around the pocket and throw. That could be what Cleveland needs, but Cleveland will need some help around him to make him successful. I see. I disagree. I think they already have the help. I think they have Josh Gordon. They have they have uh, Jordan Cameron. They have a uh, newly signed Ben Tate. They have Deion Lewis in the backfield. They're going to go grab an. I bet you they're going to go grab another running back, a la Carlos Hyde, a la you know maybe a guy. Uh, I, I don't know. I I think that they're going to grab a running back. I think that they go Sammy Watkins. I don't see I don't see how you could get a better receiving core than Josh Gordon, Sammy Watkins. They just signed Nate Burleson. They grabbed and Andrew Hawkins from the Cincinnati Bengals. They have Jordan Cameron. They have their back. At that point, I could be throwing the ball to them, and they'd be fine. I think that they're going to rely on Brian Hoyer for the meantime, say, hey, this is your team. You know, he is, a, as much as I don't like this, he's a Cleveland guy, so he fits, whatever. Um, but I think he's a serviceable quarterback, too. So I think that they're going to stick with him, and I think they're going to go with Watkins. I'm going to wait for my quarterback until the – or I already picked the quarterback, but I think there's, there's going to be a quarterback next with the Oakland Raiders. Ooh, Oakland Raiders? That's a tough one. I think the Raiders, they, the whole Terrell Pryor thing's falling through, so I don't know what they're going to need there. 
ooh, this is tough. Look at the list. There's a, they could go for Mosley. They could go for really just about anybody on this list. I think in the end, oh, my goodness. This is – there's just so many pieces. I'm going to go offensive tackle Greg Robinson. Just something there. He's one of the top guys still left on the board at that point. He's number two on this list for scouts.com, so I might as well have him there. If everybody else is drafted the way I think it's going to be. He goes five. He's a top pick, top from a – point stand wise, from a grade wise might be a beginning bl uh, piece to the puzzle to rebuild the Raiders we don't have much time so I'm going to keep this short Johnny football Johnny football is going to Oakland the pen it's, drops it's, it's, the pen drops final Benzel's mind gone off the table final mind blown episode of the day and with that yep. we're going to head into our final stories if the Blue Jackets make the playoffs and nobody's there to see it did it really happen that's the question I'm proposing to a city that is football-centric. Columbus has and will always be a city that surrounds itself behind football and basketball. However, the Blue Jackets are here, too. Amongst the big four, the NBA, the NHL, MLB, and NHL, the Blue Jackets are one of the lowest-ranked teams in terms of attendance and viewership. If it isn't a Toronto paper bashing the Blue Jackets on how they don't deserve a playoff spot, it's the half-packed arena for their penultimate home game against the Islanders. Yes. Expansion teams start off strong and struggle, but they eventually make it. Nobody wants to see the Blue Jackets be the next Seattle Sonics or Atlanta Thrashers. But if people don't come to see them and give them the attention they deserve, that may be what ends up happening in the end. I know the National Hour has a couple of episodes left throughout the semester, but I wanted to take this time to say thank you. To Jeff Hammersley, my partner in crime, I want to say that I appreciate all that you've done throughout this semester. Between producing this show and giving me blocks, and even staying late in the studio for many a night editing this masterpiece, you've given your all to the National Hour, and I hope you're proud of this tremendous project you've put together. To Franz Ross, the sports director here at Buckeye TV, thank you for putting your faith in me. As a newcomer this semester, you could have gone another path, but as Darius Thigpen battled back from heart surgery, you put your trust in my abilities and allowed me to do this show. Thank you. To Darius, I want to say thank you for allowing me to replace you as you worked your way through your heart problems. I couldn't be more thrilled that you're doing so well and were able to come back to the show for a couple of episodes throughout the semester. Finally, to you, the viewers, thank you so much for putting up with our shenanigans throughout the semester. I hope you've enjoyed watching these shows as much as I have enjoyed bringing them to you. Thank you all. And that'll be it for the National Hour for this semester. I mean, it's been, a, it's been a heck of a ride. Again, thank you, Jeff, for all that you've done. You've been a... Thank you, Hayden, here, man. I could pull off the shenanigans if you weren't here, man, because we got the Wildcat here. You got the Wildcat. Wild you got we everything got going aviators. on. Well, while we he's, got aviators. While, while he's messing around with that, I want to let you know, the viewers, um, the National Hour will be having two more episodes that will be cut short. Um, next week will be an NFL Draft special, all NFL Draft, about half an hour show, featuring Jeff Hammersley, featuring Franz Ross, sports director here at Buckeye TV, featuring Dan Hope, who is an NFL columnist, Bleacher, or NFL Draft columnist guru, for the man knows Guru for the Bleacher draft. Report. He is a, he's, I, I love the kid, to be honest with you. He does great work. I don't think he ever sleeps. When he does sleep, he's thinking about the draft. So that'll be a very, very nice show. A lot of guests will be there, so you should enjoy that. Um, again, thank you for watching the show throughout the semester, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Jeff sent him off. It's been a great ride. Goodbye, America.